everyone. Thanks for joining us here again on uh, Faith Boulevard in the museum. Before we begin the, uh, some more of our Moses and the Israelites story, I thought I'd just let you see a little bit of uh, history that Mr. Randy and I have. We actually got to go to Egypt about 40 years ago. I know that makes us really old, but I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the pictures that we took when we were there. Um, this is Mr. Randy and me, and we are on a camel, and that's my first camel ride, and it's my last camel ride. That's not a comfortable way to go. But they depended a lot on camels there in the desert because they could go a long time without having to have any water. And in the distance, maybe you can see the pyramids there, all right? So um, we, did, we did enjoy that. Mr. Randy had to go there for his work. This is the Sphinx, and you see it was the head of a human, but the body of a lion. Here's his feet right here. And really, a person would just seem so small up against that. But that was pretty amazing what they were able to build back then. You know, Egypt was a very rich country. <clears throat> Here's another view of some other pyramids. The pyramids were actually tombs for the pharaohs. And you would go down inside, and we actually went down inside one of those pyramids to one of the tombs there. <clears throat> this is another tomb. This was not built over a pyramid. It was actually just underground, and it was King Tut's tomb. And it had been untouched for thousands of years. And so the, the beautiful paintings on the walls looked exactly, almost, as they would have thousands of years ago. And that was King Tut's mummy right there. That was pretty neat. This was King Tut's mask that he had on over the mummy. All in gold, can you believe? And that was a snake. Remember, they worshipped snakes. And this was his staffs that he would hold. We also got to go to the Cairo Museum, and at that time, King Tut's um, things were on display there. So you see all of the gold there, and everything was from his tomb. That's another god they worship. So um, all of these things were just fascinating. I loved every bit of it, especially when you think about Joseph being over there, second in command to Pharaoh. I mean, imagine. So um, he would have looked similar to that. Isn't that something? Then we went to the tombs of the kings, the tombs of the queens, and the noblemen, which was across the Nile River. The best way to get around there was by donkey. That was a lot better than a camel, I can assure you, but woo, it's a little hard to get around. And our our guide was an Egyptian, and he also rode a donkey. So we went all over, up and down. And when you get to the tombs, there's big, huge steps that lead down underground into those tombs. So it was a fun day. Couldn't walk much the next day, but you know. All right, and this is one of the uh, huge uh, temples that were built to their gods. And Mr. Randy is actually standing by the head of one of those statues that has fallen. That's how huge their temples were and how important their gods were to them. We uh, took a ride on the Nile River and it was a sailboat called a Felucca. And if you see across, that's my Egyptian captain right there, by the way. If you see across the river, another huge temple that was built as well. We enjoyed ourselves. We had a good time. I loved it because of the history of the Bible that was there too, and I loved that. We're going to begin those plagues today, plagues being disasters that God is going to bring, because what did Pharaoh say when Moses and Aaron said, the God of Israel says to let his people go and worship for three days? What does Pharaoh say? God of Israel? Who is that? I don't know that God. All right, so God is about to introduce himself to Pharaoh in a very, very, very convincing way with 10 of these plagues or disasters. 
to use to convince Pharaoh not only that God is the only true God, but he's also using it to show that the gods of the Egyptians were not really gods at all. And they had no power. They were just statues. They were just images. And they couldn't help the people at all. And they're going to figure that out after a while. But remember, Pharaoh is very stubborn, isn't he? And it's going to take a while. Now, if you've been studying your plagues, you're going to know that the first one was turning the water of the Nile River into blood. And I want to read to you Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. And it says... I will, this is God speaking, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And so we know why he does these plagues. He is showing them that their gods are not really gods. And every god they have, he's going to attack that god and prove that that god is powerless. So the first god that he's going to go after was the god of the Nile River. And here's a picture of the Nile. It's very beautiful. And think about this. If you live in the desert, but you actually have a river with clean flowing water where you can get fish, where you can have your drinking water, if you didn't have that river, you would die. And so the very first thing that God is going to do is bring a plague upon that Nile River. And in doing so, there are like three gods that we could say that he was proving have no power at all. And the first god is called Hopi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But he was considered to be the god of the Nile River. All right. And his bloodstream supposedly was the water in the Nile River. So how funny that God turns it into blood, right? As his bloodstream. But he is, he's going, we're going to see that this god, Hopi, is powerless to stop them from uh, destroying their, their water. The other one is Kanum, who was the god of creation and water, they thought. And he was considered to be the source of the Nile water. And so once again, where was he when God struck the Nile with blood? The other god might have been Osiris, who's the god of life and death and resurrection and who made things grow supposedly okay so god's showing that these three gods they're pretty worthless to you and so here's what happens and we're going to start reading in chapter 8 and um, it says the lord said to moses pharaoh's heart is still not not unyielding it's still unyielding in other words he's just not listening to what we're saying he refuses to let the people go so you go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river and you wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand that staff that changed into a snake and then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. And this is what I will do. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, the river will stink, and the Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. Now that would be pretty scary. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the streams and the canals and over the uh, ponds and the reservoirs and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in their wooden buckets and their jars. In other words, if they had already gone to get their water, the water will turn to blood that's in their house too. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He raised his staff and he changed the water into blood. But Pharaoh's magicians were able to take some water and look, make it look like it turned into blood as well. So here's what Pharaoh does. Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said he would. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not even take any of this into heart. Can you imagine? 
Now no one has any water to drink and he just goes, oh well, and he turns and goes back into his palace again. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile River, just in little areas away from the Nile to try to get the water to come up that wasn't polluted with blood. That's all they had to drink. Crazy, huh, that Pharaoh didn't even let that bother him. He just goes on about his business. So God's going to have to send another plague. That was plague number one. Plague number two, ooh, to me, this is one of the worst, except for the last. This one would really creep me out. It would gross me out. And it involves frogs. And here's what happens. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile River. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, then I will plague the whole country with frogs. Ooh. The Nile will be covered with frogs. They will come up into your palace and into your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and on your people and into the ovens where you cook and into the bread bowls where you're making bread. The frogs will go up on you and on your people and all your officials. Ooh, disgusting. And then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams, the canals, and the ponds, and make the frogs come up and on the land of Egypt. And so that's what, that's what Aaron did. But now the magicians tricked Pharaoh and made it look like they could make frogs appear as well. What they couldn't do, though, was make the frogs go away. And that's important to know, isn't it? Now, there was even a frog god. Can you believe that? There was a god, Hecate is her name, the goddess of water and renewal, supposedly. And if you wanted to have lots of children, you wore a frog, a, an image of her around your neck so that you would be able to have a lot of children. Can you believe that, that a frog is going to do all of that for you and protect you? <sighs> Well, they learned that's not really true. That frog god could do nothing for them. And so, when they got sick and tired of having frogs and stepping on them and trying to eat their meals with frogs inside, ooh, then Pharaoh calls for Moses and Aaron. Okay, now he's a little worried, so he sends them to his palace. Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Okay, he's had enough of frogs, and his magicians can't get rid of them. So, okay, I will. So Moses said to Pharaoh, okay, I will leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for the frogs that will go back into the Nile. In other words, Moses is saying, just to prove to you that it's not something your magicians did, that it's only the true God that's going to do it. You tell me when, and that's when the frogs will go away. And Pharaoh says, tomorrow, tomorrow. And so Moses goes and he talks to God. And he says, all right, God, Pharaoh's ready. And he says, all right, we'll get rid of the frogs. And so the frogs died in the houses, in their courtyards, in the fields. They were piled into heaps. Ooh. And the land reeked of them. It smelled so bad of rotting frogs. Ooh, nasty, huh? But here's the, the verse. But when Pharaoh saw that they were gone, he hardened his heart, became so stubborn, and he wouldn't listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord said. All right, so this next um, play, God isn't going to give Pharaoh a chance to even, he's not even going to ask him, will you let the people go? They're just going to cause a plague to come down. And this plague is called lice in some translations and gnats in other translations. We're going to learn it as 
uh, I learned it in our poem is where with its lice, but it probably was little tiny gnats. Do you know little gnats that, that that can crawl and they get all up in your nose sometimes and your ears and oh you get on your food ooh everywhere. So Moses is here's what we're going to find out about that. So strike the dust of the ground. That's what Aaron is supposed to do. And the dust of the earth will become gnats. Can you imagine? And they did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came upon men and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. Ooh. All right. And believe it or not, there was actually a god that was the god of the earth or the god of the dust. His name was Geb. All right, so by striking the dust of the earth, they're showing them that Geb has no power over the dust of the earth or the earth or anything because now that dust is gnats, nothing but gnats. But here's the interesting part. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats as well by their secret tricks, they could not do it. Aha. Uh -huh. And the gnats were on everything. All the people and all the animals. Now the magicians can't do that anymore. And here's what the magicians said to Pharaoh. This is pretty amazing. This is the finger of God. In other words, this has nothing to do with us or people. This is God. A real God is doing this. But Pharaoh's heart was hard. And he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Well, we've got a bunch more to do, and we will be talking about the rest of them next week. Remember your porn. Water to blood, frogs, lice, flies, disease of cattle, they all died. Boils, hell, locusts, dark, death of the firstborn, Israel departs. We're also going to give you two worksheets that you can do. A color sheet, let my people go and a word jumble, and you unscramble the words to make the 10 plagues, all right? Work on those. We are gonna find a way for you to be able to say the 12 sons of Jacob and this poem to us, and you will get a gift card, we promise. By next week, we're gonna figure something out for you so you can know that's what's gonna happen. So don't give up this summer. Keep working, keep listening, Keep learning. Keep reading your Bibles, okay? We love you. Be the best you can be. Bye-bye.